from Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Earl Foreman here. Foreman? Uh, Tri-State Life and Casualty. I'm the branch office manager down here. Oh, sorry, Mr. Foreman, but the answer is no. Uh, Well, this is an arson case, Dollar, and we're already having to make one payoff on it. I'm sorry, but it'll have to wait. I'm going to get as far away from this New England winter as I can. Well, for that, I don't blame you, but there's no reason you shouldn't come Look, I've had a rough year of it. I'm tired and I'm cold. And unless I can get down to where the warm, balmy breezes waft in... Dollar, I have got to have you on this case. There's a lot at stake. Now, my office is down here in... No, sir, I'm sorry. You see... Down here in Sarasota. I just can't do it, Mr. Foreman. I've already made a plane reservation for Sarasota, Florida. And this is one time I'm going to... Where did you say your branch office is? Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Tri-State Life and Casualty Insurance Company, Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the burning car matter. Expense account item one, which I thought I was going to have to absorb myself. $129, transportation and incidentals to Sarasota, Florida. It was nearly 5 p.m. when I got there, so instead of checking into a hotel, I taxied, that's item two, a dollar even, I taxied to Earl Foreman's office in the Conroy building. He turned out to be a tall, lanky, easygoing fellow with clear blue eyes and a ready smile. Sit in an office and talk business this time of day? You're in Florida now, Johnny. Well, I thought from your call this was a pretty urgent matter, Mr. Foreman. It is. Arson, you said. Yeah, probably, but here's no reason we can't go out to my little shack on the key and be comfortable while we talk about it. Besides, Mike will want you for dinner. Mike? Uh, My wife, Gertrude. Oh. Uh, Come on, my jalopy's right out at the curb. Come on, Johnny. Poor man was a misnomer for this man because his jalopy turned out to be a spanking new Cadillac, complete with air conditioning and all the fixings. And the shack, anything but. It was on St. Armand's Key across Sarasota Bay from the mainland, a beautiful two-story concrete and stucco job. The big yard backed on a quiet bayou, and there tied up at a private dock was a 24-foot lap strake speedboat, ideal for fishing the Gulf of Mexico. After all, as long as you're down here on expense account. Yeah, but it's charged to your company, remember? Oh. <laughs> hey, there she is at the door. Huh? The big, fat, overbearing broad I'm married to. This was another switch. For Earl's wife standing in the doorway was the cutest little trick I'd seen in a long time. Petite, pretty, and blonde, and with eyes that you notice right away because they were almost green. Eyes that suddenly narrowed as she looked at me. And I wondered why. Johnny? Dollar, did you say? That's right. Insurance investigator down here to look into those fires. Oh. Any objections? No. No, of course not. Just set your bags here in the hall, Johnny. All right, thanks. And wouldn't you like a drink after your long trip? Yeah, and you can get me one, too. Scotch, Johnny? Martin ZVO. Oh, great. Well, soda, please. Uh, sit down, sit down. Thanks. I, uh, I take it Mike isn't too interested in the insurance business, huh? <laughs> uh, you know, she used to be a singer, dancer. Oh, well, this is a little different. But now, tell me all. Well, actually, I guess we ought to wait until Arnold Carr gets back. Carr? Uh, Carr Brothers, Lumber Enterprises. Arnold runs the business, and his brother Edward... <laughs> well, Ed just shares the profits. Real black sheep of the family, from what I've been able to learn. Oh, Anyway, they have yards all over the state. There's one here in Sarasota, one up the coast a ways at Fort Pierce, and still another at Arcadia. That's about 40 miles inland, just east of here. And there was one up in Orlando. Was? Completely destroyed by fire a couple of weeks ago. And a $120,000 claim has been filed. A hundred and... Wow. That's where Arnold Carr has been, in Orlando, trying to clear things up. Here's your drink. Oh, thanks. Here, Earl. Yeah, well, to the gods and goddesses and us. But shouldn't I be up in Orlando, then? Uh, Arnold's on his way back here now. He lives here. 
He just went up there to arrange for clearing off and selling the property. You mean he's planning to just pocket the money? If Tri-State pays off, I mean. Looks like it. But I take it you suspect arson. Yes, Earl suspects arson, Johnny, and so does Arnold Carr. At least he says he does, but they have no reason. No? How about the other fires? Or attempted fires? Oh, where? At Arcadia, for one, but they got it out in time. At least that's the way Arnold Carr reported it. The way he Let tells me it... tell it, Mike. Oh. There was another at the yard here in Sarasota. Arnold himself discovered it one night when he was just driving around. But nothing to indicate it was attempted arson. No, well, uh, and the authorities up in Orlando found no indication of it there. Mike, you know as well as I do that a lumberyard fire will obliterate signs of arson better than any other kind of fire in the world. Yeah, but she has a point, though, Earl. Unless there's some evidence of arson. Of course. Yeah, why send for me? Well, mostly because... Actually, of... because Arnold Carr suspects him. But he's given you no real reason. None at all. I think he has a real reason, but he just won't tell us. Wait till you see him. He's going to call when he gets in. We'll run over to his place on Longboat Key. What about his brother? Edward, did you say? I've never met him. He's always stayed in Orlando. I was wondering if he might tell things that Arnold is holding back. Oh, Ed, Edward Carr wouldn't know anything. Uh, you can never be too sure. Ed, Ed, look, why can't you agree with me for a... Uh, that must be Arnie now. Excuse me. Hello? Uh... This is Arnold Carr. Oh, hi, Arnie. Uh, Johnny Dollar arrived, so we'll be... Uh, well, here, I'll let you talk to him. Here, Johnny. Uh, no. Okay. No, Earl, listen. What? Uh, I told you before it was arson. It was arson again tonight. Tonight? What's that? Uh, Arcadia just went up in flames. The whole yard. Good Lord. Did you hear that, Johnny? Yeah, I heard it. Well, can you prove it was arson uh, tonight in Arcadia and before in Orlando? I... I have proof. Well, Arnie, we'll be over just as fast no. as... No. What? No. Wait for me there at your home. Well, but look now. You mustn't come here. And I, I mustn't stay here because I... Uh, I... Now, listen, man. You, uh, uh, Arnie? Well, I guess he's ready to tell us now. A suspicion began to grow in my mind. A suspicion that Mike apparently shared with me, that Arnold Carr himself might be responsible for the fires. After all, he was the only one who had seemed to know about the two unsuccessful attempts. He himself had planted the idea of arson. He'd lost no time in filing claim for the Orlando burnout. But Earl said I was wrong. Arnold was too honest a man. Earl had also said we were only 15 minutes from Carr's home. So when half an hour passed, we called him back, got a busy signal. After the fourth try, the three of us took off in Earl's cab. As we pulled into Carr's driveway, we could see him through the picture window, sitting at his desk, telephone in hand, apparently engrossed in a call. Then, as we walked up to the door, I noticed something else. Arnold Carr looked enough like me to be my brother. Maybe that explained Mike's reaction when she first saw me. Hey, Arnie! Can't you see? He's on the phone in there. Well, the least he can do is hear his own doorbell. Earl, wait. Good Lord. What's the matter? Through the window. Oh, no. Earl? Stand back. Earl, for heaven's sake, what is it? Couldn't you see from out there? No, what's wrong? I... I... Well, Johnny, right through the forehead, Earl. Looks like a thirty-eight. Before I could stop him, Earl took the phone out of the dead man's hand and called headquarters. Mike turned pale and slumped into a chair. And I gave the place a quick rundown, checked doors, windows, etc. A few minutes later, an officious young sergeant named Larkin arrived and took over. 38 caliber, straight through the middle of the forehead. Were all three of you here when it happened? Mr. Foreman, Mrs. Foreman, and uh, who are you? The answer to your first question, Sergeant, is no, none of us was here. And this is Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. Hiya. You insurance guys work pretty fast. You related to Mr. Carr? No, why? You look a little like him. Who busted in the front door? The killer? I did. When we drove up, we saw Mr. Carr sitting there at his desk. We rang the doorbell and knocked, but... And when he didn't move, you took things in your own hands and busted in, huh? That's right. You haven't moved anything, have you? No. Except I took the phone out of his hand to call you. Dollar, if you're any kind of investigator, you should have known better than let him touch anything. Now, now, let's see. The shot must have come from somewhere near this window by the fire. Ah, oh, sure, here we are. Bullet hole right through the pane. Bullet was fired from outside. 
You're sure, Sergeant? Sure, I'm sure. Look for yourself. You call yourself an investigator? Hey, Cummings, will they? Check the area around that window beside the chimney out there for footprints. Maybe an empty cartridge case. Now, you folks get out of here so I can call Doc Hanley over and get on with my investigation. And no, Dollar, I don't need any of your help. Well, thank you, Sergeant. Your job is fires, not... Hey, where did Mrs. Porman go? Out to the car. Why? Who told her she could leave? Who told her she had to sit here looking at a corpse? All right, Dollar, all right. Just be sure the three of you stick around town in case I decide to question you further. Oh, of course, Sergeant. Yeah. Yeah. Not shot by somebody standing outside? What do you mean, Johnny? Oh, I spotted that bullet hole in the window, too. So? I also noticed there were no particles of glass on the inside sill. But there were some on the outside. Yeah. The shot that made that hole was fired from inside that room to make it look as though it had come from outside. Then somebody was in there with Arnold Carr. Yeah. Either somebody he let in or who had normal access to the house. And he had to stop Arnold from talking about the fire in Arcadia. Hey, how much do you know about his brother, Edward? Well, nothing really outside of what Arnold told me. Was either of them married, family of any sort? Arnie wasn't, but I... Arnold's death means Edward will own the business then. Yes. And he lives up in Orlando, scene of the first big fire. Yes, very good heavens. Johnny, you don't think his own brother... Where can I rent a car? Take Mike Chevy. It's in the carport at the house. But what are you going to do? Drive up to Orlando by way of Arcadia. When I got to Arcadia, only a few people were standing around the remains of the fire. One hose company was still working on it, and a couple of police were poking about in the embers. Walking toward it, I almost stumbled over a little old man sitting alone in the darkness beside a palm tree, hunched over, his head in his hands, sobbing. He didn't even look up when I stopped beside him. It's like losing part of my own life, it is. You, uh, you lost someone in the fire, sir? No, son. Only part of my life. I helped build up that yard, me and Mr. Arnie. Arnold Carr. All along, he's been worried about it. Last week, when him and me smelled smoke and come over here and put out the barrel of trash that was smoldering, he knew. Knew what? That somebody was trying to burn him out? That's why he stopped by tonight on his way home. That's why we drove over here, him and me. And I brought my gun just in case. Yeah. Well, we got here too late. It was already blazing. And when he seen the automobile pulling away... What auto? Yes, Frank, he said to me. I knowed he was the one trying to burn me out, he said. Who? Who, old timer? Who do you mean? He he didn't say. Then he called the fire department. That car that pulled away, what was it? Just an auto, big white Buick. But he tied it in with whoever set the fire. All he said was, I knowed he was the one. Do you know who it was he meant? Well. He told me even if I did know, I should never tell. Even the police. Well, who do you think it was? Break my word to Mr. Arnie? Uh-uh. Never, son. All right, look, old man, I'm sorry to have to tell you this. Mr. Arnie's dead. What? What, he... But he can't be. He was... You. Huh? Uh, maybe you thought in the darkness I would know you. But I do know you, you... Oh, now, just a minute, old-timer. If Mr. Arnie's dead, it's because you killed him. What? Just like you set the fire. No, no, I'm not who you think I am. And I'll kill you. That's what I'll do. Put down that gun. I'll kill you. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Back in the old days, the very old days, that is, a girl named Cassandra had a corner on the Oracle market. But nowadays, you can do some foretelling yourself. On Jukebox Jury, for example, you can help decide which of Tin Pan Alley's new recordings are destined for the hit brackets and which ones are likely to spiral all the way down to oblivion. Remember, Jukebox Jury is yours to hear on most of these same stations every Sunday. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the burning car matter. (laughs) 
Expense account, item three, $5.15, gas for the borrowed Chevy to keep me going to Orlando. Either the old man's eyesight was bad or he was just a lousy shot. Either way, it was okay by me. I hated to slap him down, but there was no point hanging around Arcadia trying to explain things to the local authorities. So after making sure I hadn't really hurt him, I appropriated his gun and took off fast. He'd thought I was someone else. Even I had noticed a family-type resemblance to myself in Arnold Carr. Sergeant Larkin had asked me if I was related to him. And now the old man at the fire had apparently thought I was the one who... Oh, well, I'm afraid I made the rest of the trip to Orlando in somewhat less than legal time. And at police headquarters, I barged into the office of Lieutenant Cal Hudson without bothering to be announced. So early in the morning? Sit down while I finish up report, Mr. Carr. Uh, thanks. I was trying to reach you, but we got no answer to the phone at your house. Well, that's very interesting, Lieutenant. I'm afraid I have the painful duty of notifying you that your brother Arnold down in Sarasota last night... Why did you say very interesting, Mr. Carr? Or had you already learned... Well, I'll be doggone. Yeah. You're not the first one. Who are you? Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. I can't believe it. You... Dollar, you look enough like Edward Carr to be his twin... You even sound a lot like it. I take it you haven't located Edward yet? Well, no. Lieutenant, I think Edward Carr is the firebug we're after. And the killer. Wait a minute. Briefly as possible, I told him of Arnold Carr's phone call to Earl Poorman. His emotional upset just before he was killed. I told him Arnold had been murdered by someone inside the house, someone close to him. And that everything indicated that someone could very well be Edward Carr. That's still all just theory, Dollar, without any proof. Well, I will admit that Edward is a pretty worthless playboy living off the profits of the lumberyard. In any event, the lieutenant promised to put out an APB on Edward Carr. That was at breakfast for the two of us, item four, three dollars and a quarter. Before I left him, he gave me Ed Carr's address, 1726 Allen Place. As I expected, there was no answer to the doorbell at 1726, so I tried visiting up the street. It quickly became clear that Ed Carr wasn't very popular in this otherwise quiet, well-ordered neighborhood. Those big, noisy parties at all hours of the night, cars parked up and down the street, blocking respectable people's driveways. Yes, ma'am, You know, well... once in a while you expect a person to have callers and such. Me, I have the Ladies' Bridge Club every third Wednesday, for instance. Well, that's nice. But these are all ladies, not like some of the trash that that man and his friends have, dancing and drinking and carrying on at all hours. Yes, you mentioned cars, Mrs. You know, Oh, people like Mrs. Herford Robin. She's awfully nice. And Janet Osterworthy. Now, she's a widow. Well, and, you know, she could have her pick of anybody she liked. But does she ever look at another man? No, sir. And then there's Mrs. Mrs. Harper. Uh, yes? You mentioned cars. Do you know what kind Mr. Carr drove? Why, yes. It was a big white one. And the make? Well, no. My husband, when he was alive, always drove a Maxwell, and I guess that's the only kind I ever got to know by name. But Mr. Cars is white. Only I guess that isn't much help to you, is it? All the white cars here in Florida, I mean. Look. Now, even that blonde hussy who's around him all the time drives a white car. Oh, I really shouldn't use a word like that, though, should I? But it fits... Wait a minute. What blonde, Mrs. Harper? Mr. Dollar. I don't pay any attention to people like that. Why, you'd think she owned that house of his, the way she keeps popping in and out all hours as if she belonged there. Mrs. Harper. And drives all the way up from Sarasota, too. Do you know who she is? I do not. I refuse to pay any attention to people like... And the way she dresses, too, like a newly rich chorus girl with all her fancy clothes and furs and things. How do you know she comes from Sarasota? By the license on her car, of course. Every city has its own number. You know that very well. And hers is 12WW something. And you don't know her name? Of course not. Flaunting all those expensive furs as though she bought and paid for them herself. And if there's anything I hate to see, it's a little shrimp loaded down with furs. Now, a tall person I like see. me... I see. Well, her thanks. Eyes... <gasps> if there's anyone I don't trust, it's a person with green eyes. Well, Thank I you, can't... Mrs. Harper. Her description of Carr's girlfriend stopped me in my tracks. That description could fit Mike Poorman to the letter. Petite, blonde, green eyes, and she came from Sarasota. And then I remembered Mike's reaction when she first saw me. 
her dismissal of Edward as a possible suspect. There was obvious friction between Earl and Mike, too. I figured it was just normal in a couple who'd been married for a while. But now... Item 5, a dollar thirty phone call from the nearest booth I could find to Earl Poorman at his office in Sarasota. No, she isn't, Johnny. Why? Well, do you know where Mike is? When I woke up this morning, I could hear her talking to her girlfriend, Betty, on the phone downstairs. Betty? Uh, Betty lives here in Sarasota. They used to be on the stage together, sister act, you know. Yeah, well... Uh... Uh, well, then when I went down for breakfast, she was gone. Took my car, too. I had to come here to the office in a taxi. Yeah, well, okay, Earl. Thanks a lot. Hey, uh, now, wait a minute. How are you doing? You found out anything I ought to know about this arson and murder business? Uh, no, Earl. Nothing that you need to worry about. Liar. I sat down at a corner drugstore. That's item five, 80 cents, over a sandwich and a Coke to try to think things out. But I'm afraid I didn't like anything that I thought. Finally, I drove over to Allen Place again. I parked a couple of blocks away and walked to 1726. I rang the front doorbell, knocked a couple of times. Then I slipped around to the back door, finagled a lock on it with a little celluloid pocket calendar, finally got it open. I left it open for the sake of a quick exit if such became necessary. But I guess that was a mistake. For a couple of minutes later, as I rounded a corner from the den into the living room, I felt the barrel of a gun poked into my back. Out of town, huh? Now, wait a minute. Don't move, Eddie boy. Trying to stall off, pay me the five grand by saying you're going to be out of town, huh? Okay, so you think I'm Edward Carr. You kidding. Don't you know what happens when somebody tries to stall me? This. I don't know exactly how long I was out, but when I came to, it was dark. Except for the glow from a streetlight outside. And what roused me was the sound of footsteps, feminine steps, cautiously entering the back door. Then, briefly, silhouetted against a window, I saw a trim, petite figure that was all too familiar coming toward me. And she saw me, too. Oh, darling, you're hurt. What happened? Uh, what do you think? Who did this? Who struck you? You don't know? Yes, of course. It was Tony. Because you didn't pay him soon enough for the Arcadia job. Here, Eddie, let me help no, you. No, no, just let me rest for a minute. I thought that was Tony I passed on the road in from Sarasota. Why'd you come over from Sarasota? To see you. I knew you'd be here. Oh, why? Why? So the police could surprise you with the news of your poor dear brother's death. But why did you come to the house? Because I hoped you'd come here, I guess. Eddie, you should have waited until I could raise the money to pay off Tony. You mean for killing Arnold, too? Of course. No. Are you trying to say you didn't kill Arnold? But I saw you from outside in the Buick. You'd swear to that, wouldn't you? I, I don't know what you... Eddie, you sound like you don't trust me. We're in this thing together. Yeah, you sure of that? What are you talking about? Whose idea was it to knock off Arnold? But you had to. When he saw you at Arcadia, he, he knew that you were having the yards burned up. That's the way you figured it from the beginning, wasn't it? Now, look, baby. First burn up the lumber yards and collect the insurance on them. Then convince me that you and I should have it all by putting Arnold out of the way. But you had to kill Ar... I don't understand you, Eddie. Yeah, and I wish I didn't understand you, Mike. Mike? Come on. Let's turn on the light. No. No. Somebody sees us. Eddie, you... Who... Who are you? Are you kidding, Mike? I... Wait a minute. Who are you? You're that insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar, that Mike told me. Let me out of here. Oh, no, you don't. You're staying right here. <laughs> Mike Poorman's sister, aren't you? Well? No, oh, sister. <laughs> So we once did a sister act before she married that poor man guy. Now, let, let me go. Not by a long shot. You may as well, Dollar. What? Eddie. No move, Dollar. Get his gun, Betty. Get it. Yeah, yeah, sure. Here, Ed. Good. Ed Carr, huh? That's right. You know, we do look alike, you and me. Yeah, sure. Enough for Betty here to have told me all I need to know. Don't believe him, Eddie. He's lying. I heard, No, baby. Eddie, I, I thought he was you. Don't you see? Sure, him? sure. Why'd you come up here anyway? Because Mike told me that Dollar was coming up here. You've been shooting off your mouth to her, too? She knew about us. She thought you might have something to do with the fire. She was my friend. She was trying to get me out of this whole mess, and I wish I'd listened to well, her. Well, it's too late now, baby. Eddie, what are you going to do? Now i got to get rid of both of no! them. No! And figure some way to shut up Tony's mouth. Ed, please! You know you'd never get away with it, Carr. Oh, no, I'll call him. That's what I'll do. 
Yeah, Betty, and he'll come here to get his money. Then I'll call the police, see? Tell him to come right away. Tell him I found out about you having Tony start the fire. What? That's right, that you had him burn up the yard so there'd be even more money for you to bleed from me, like all the dough you got from me already. You're crazy, Ed. I'll tell the police to meet me here. And when they come in, it'll just be in time to see me kill Tony in self-defense after getting here too late to save you, I'll tell them. You're out of your mind. They'll check that gun of yours so fast. And that'll prove it. Because the only shot out of my gun will be the one that gets Tony. This gun of yours is the one that's going to knock you two off. And they'll think it's Tony. Oh, Eddie, please, you're drunk. Are you crazy? Crazy to save my own life, to keep you and Tony and Dollar from putting a noose around my neck? If you think that harebrained scheme of yours will ever work, you're it's off your It's got to work, because it's my only chance. So it's going to work now. <laughs> Thanks, Lieutenant. I'm afraid I was too late to save it, Johnny. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. But Eddie Carl lived to face a jury. What brought you here anyhow? I did, Johnny. Mike, stay there. Stay right here, Mike. I know. I don't want to see it. She was my friend. Where's Earl? I came alone. When I talked to Betty this morning, I knew your suspicions about Ed were right because, you see, I knew Betty and Ed were going together. Earl didn't know. Yeah. Maybe you better call him. Expense account item six, nine dollars eighty cents, gas and incidentals for the drive for the two of us back to Sarasota. Remarks? Betty, of course, has already paid for her part in the deal. And I guess it's pretty obvious what'll happen to Ed Carr and Tony Ricardo. The insurance money in the Carr estates will be distributed according to Florida law. Further remarks, the apparent friction between Earl and Mike was only part of a normal married life. They're a pretty nice pair. Oh, and I thoroughly enjoyed three days of fishing in the Gulf, thanks to Earl. Expense account total, including all the incidentals I could think of, 385.26. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Our star will return in just a moment. You don't have to be an efficiency expert to figure out that it's easier to lend your support to several worthwhile fundraising campaigns all at once than it would be helping one campaign at a time. That kind of efficiency is yours to enjoy through the United Community Campaigns. CBS Radio hopes that when the United Community Campaigns are underway in your town, that you'll remember how much good you can accomplish with one gesture of support. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a case with a real twist. One that I think will just about tear your heart out. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Harley Bear, Victor Perrin, Bob Bruce, Harry Bartell, Vivi Janus, Tony Barrett, and Junius Matthews. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Dan Coverly speaking. <laughs>